Well, good morning. So glad that you're here in person and online. Thanks for joining us. We're so happy that you decided to be here this weekend. Um, before we get any further, I just want to brag on that family. Uh, they're incredible. I think that video showed a testimony of what uh, and why our mission exists here at Hope, uh, to help people connect, grow, and serve. Um, but also for the people very much sharing their story and how um, God has just planted that on their heart too. And so uh, the Pittmans have been such a blessing to me. Weeks, weeks, and a long time ago, I had mentioned a guy that I was talking with. We talk a lot about our gifts and abilities, right? And how we have these maybe specific gifts that we work with uh, in, in, church, in, in, our, in ministry here or uh, out in the community. Uh, but we really challenge that sometimes we, we get, make that a pass for if we, there's no gifts to be used in church or in the community, we can just not serve at all. But yet we challenge you that you do have abilities too, like scrubbing a toilet or something like that, right? You know, we have these innate abilities that we can kind of do anything uh, in any act of service. And so with this family, this was a guy who sat down with me, and I asked him to serve in a specific way in student ministry as we were talking, and he was feeling led to serve in student ministry. But he had sat down and said, I don't think I'm gifted in that way, but here are all my abilities. In what way could I serve uh, with these abilities? And it was just so beautiful, this picture of using both your gifts and abilities, because he's clearly gifted at guitar and things like that, but he uh, wanted to use his abilities elsewhere too. So this is really cool, a really good testimony for that. I wanted to share that. Um, but hey, this morning, before we go any further too, I just want to take a quick moment and, and just kind of begin with prayer, uh, specifically for our friends in Florida. Uh, this last week and, and beyond, we've been hearing the rumors and things to come of Hurricane Ian, and so far it's struck land and left many without, uh, without uh, completely destroyed everything for some, and also killed others. And so we want to just come before God today together and just spend a time in prayer uh, and asking for our friends, on behalf of our friends in Florida, just for healing and safety, but also that as they begin to, um, you know, build back what was there and begin to, um, you know, look for the things they need, that the Lord would provide in a unique way. Uh, I was convicted, though, this morning that before that, um, I think often I come up here and, and others do, and we just quickly pray for you, but I actually want to take a step back and allow you to pray specifically, too, uh, as maybe you have friends or family, or maybe you've visited and seen uh, and just been a part of uh, the culture of Florida that is now swept away and needs some rebuilding, and so I'm just going to take a step back. It's going to be maybe a little awkward, but we're all friends and family here, don't worry. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a few moments to just pray individually, and then I'll close us together in prayer. So I'll step back and just maybe pray for things like peace in a time like this, as many have evacuated and are looking how to get back home, and home isn't the way it was. Pray for safety as the many are going to serve and clean up. Pray that the Lord would provide as many have lost homes and things that they'll never get back in the same way, but the Lord would provide and, and give what they need today. So if you could pray alongside me for that, then I'll close. So, Lord, we ask for our friends, maybe family in Florida now, that on their behalf we pray, God, that you would bring peace. It's such a time of, of destruction, God, that you would be so present and near and draw near, Lord. May they see that you're near because you are. And, and, Lord, I just ask that you would um, repair what has been broken, God, not only uh, mentally for many who have evacuated and are looking to return to home that wasn't the way it was, but God, um, physically and in specific ways, Lord, tangibly, would you just begin to repair what has been broken? God, we trust you with our friends, but it's so hard to picture friends or family like my, my buddy Blake, who is a pastor in Sarasota, and it's just his community is destroyed and thinking of the many feet and hands who will serve you by picking up what's broken and repairing it. 
God, I just pray for boldness and strength for our friends. God, I just ask that you would lead us and guide us to do what maybe you would ask us to do in this season of of giving to contribute to what's happened or even being feet and hands to go. Lord, wherever you would like for us to be, Lord, I pray that we would continually pray. We continually be in prayer for our friends. God, we love you and trust you even in the, the craziest of circumstances we face. God, you are still sovereign and good and we trust you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for doing that. This morning we're going to be in 1 Peter. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and crack it open to 1 Peter. If you don't have a Bible, there's one underneath your chair most likely. Uh, But really quickly, we're going to kind of get into an overview of 1 Peter a bit. And then we're going to land on our passage uh, today. And so 1 Peter, you may know Peter a little bit, but we're going to kind of discover him together. Peter's the author here, and he was helped later on, we realized, by this guy named Silvanus write this letter specifically. And he wrote it to a group of churches in what's known as Asia Minor. And in modern day, we see it as Turkey. Okay, and so it's a group of churches there that we're, they were facing persecution and harassment. And honestly, at this point, they were discouraged. And the interesting part about this in our series so far is we've realized that a lot of our letters are written to churches and people who were discouraged and persecuted and had moments where they are harassed for the gospel of Jesus. And the beauty about reading these letters is I believe today even, God may reveal to us like, and strengthen us as we face maybe some similar things in our world today when we stand for the gospel of Jesus. And so uniquely, I love when God's word, God's word does this and applies to us in a really specific way, although different in context to these people here too. But Peter was this guy who, uh, you know him through most of the Gospels as the disciple, Peter, right? See, uh, quick notes about Peter here. Uh, Peter is uh, the guy who Jesus rebuked the most, more than any other disciple. Peter confessed Jesus, though, more boldly than any other disciple, Okay, Uh, Peter also denied Jesus more boldly than any other disciple. Okay, your mind's working now, right? You maybe remember or know this guy, Peter. But also Jesus praised Peter more than any of his other disciples. And so you can picture the, the relationship between Jesus and Peter was very unique. And although Jesus loved every one of his disciples in a very unique way, but we see naturally Peter had this life that was like a roller coaster, and if you're a roller coaster fan, anybody, I'm a big roller coaster fan. I love them. Uh, Adventureland's okay, like I, but I wish there was like a Six Flags closer. That would be super cool. But I guess Adventureland and Six Flags are the same distance. Is that technically right? You know, Six Flags, Chicago, three hours. Des Moines, three hours. We'll confirm after the service. No big deal. But basically, I, I, I just love roller coasters. Wish there were some closer to here. But, you know, we see this kind of, in just those few statements, this kind of roller coaster of a life that Peter was living for Christ, that Peter had with Jesus. And these few moments biblically, right, in Luke 5, when Peter puts out his nets at the direction of Jesus and, and just grabs a giant catch of fish in obedience. Or when Peter stepped out of the boat during a raging storm in Matthew 14 and actually walked on water with Jesus, okay? A really unique moment, and I love to just, uh, some people say, you know, Jesus was the only one to walk on water. And I say, but remember the half the time that one guy did, but he fell in, right? You know, like, we got to remember those moments, too. Peter was this faithful, obedient servant, yet also had his falling, too. Peter saw Jesus transfigured in glory in Matthew 17, Peter was also the one who asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive one another? And what's interesting, uh, that's in Matthew 18 as well. What's interesting is that, you know, that question spurs on what might be happening. Sometimes we ask questions based on what's happening in our life, right? And so Peter's like, how often should we forgive someone? And so unique, he would ask it, and Jesus would respond, how? Basically, infinitely. We should always be forgiving for your Lord. Like, God is forgiving. We should always express forgiveness to our friends, our family members. Peter denies Jesus three times. That's that moment, right? Peter denies Jesus three times in Matthew 26, where he's full of shame and guilt. For Jesus pre-told this, but yet he still did it. So we're kind of learning Peter, Peter. Peter saw Jesus after he had been resurrected in John 21. So Peter, alongside others that followed Jesus, and 500 more had actually seen Jesus. So Jesus dying on the cross and then resurrected again actually sees him in the flesh. How beautiful that must have been. And then unique and kind of scary maybe too, right? But Peter was one of these many to see Jesus after he had been resurrected. 
So now we're kind of building this picture of who Peter is, not only the disciple, but now in this letter, the apo- an apostle of God, the apostle Peter. And so maybe a few key passages before we go into our main passage in 1 Peter 1 this morning that I just want to kind of give you some insight on and kind of the overall book of 1 Peter. And then I want us to t- dissect and sit in a specific passage this morning. But here in 1 Peter 2, 9, right, Peter r- reminds us, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Essentially, Peter's saying the privilege and place of God's people is high. He prioritizes and loves us. He cares for us so deeply that he would welcome us into a relationship with him. But for what? That we may bring praises to him. We declare praises for he called us out of darkness into wonderful light. So now we're beginning to see that Peter's urging us to live in the so inheritance of Christ we've received on earth too. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. See, the suffering of Jesus, this example for us, that he died for our sins so we may be seen without sin before God in righteousness. So he atoned for our sins, but yet may we continually die to our sins and take on righteousness in this present day, now. And we are able to live in, in a pursuit of holiness. See, Peter at the end of this passage is quoting Isaiah 53, 5. And so you can write that down, Isaiah 53, 5, which says, but he was pierced for our transgress- transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And finally, 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, which is one of my favorite passages in scripture, because I believe it begins to narrow down our pursuit and, and, where, and also just our defense of our hope. In 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, it says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keep, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. This is the cornerstone passage verse of what we call apologetics. And apologetics off the cuff, if you don't know much about it, it's not an apology for our faith, but yet it's a reason and building of a defense of our faith and understanding why it's reasonable and right to believe in our Christian faith and our pursuit of Jesus. Uh, So I'm like like conflicted because I'm the student pastor here and I love students, 6th through 12th graders represent. I also work with college students and so it kind of, a few roles, but anyways, our students right now, this morning, uh, our middle schoolers are beginning the study of apologetics. And so my heart's kind of torn because I love, I love building a defense and reason for my faith that we not build it to shame others, but yet in respect, defend our faith and show others who God is and how good he is. And so apologetics is really core to our continued growth in Christ, both in knowledge and in application. Because by apologetics, we grow to know, but also apologetics and what Peter's saying here, we actually grow to do as we we were revealed more of who Christ is and the truth of the history of of what actually happened lines up so perfectly with what Christ actually did on earth. And so these are just a few passages to kind of familiar, just get yourself familiar with 1 Peter. But I would encourage you uh, that this week, if you haven't already, just maybe read through 1 Peter for yourself. Because there's so much more for you there, uh, from God for you there, that that we're going to get to today. But just read through it and begin to soak yourself into what Peter's really directing and talking to us about. That we'll get to in a little bit of it in a moment. And you've probably heard me say it so far, but today I've I've titled my message, The Pursuit of Holiness, and I believe this morning might be a beginning work in your heart to what the pursuit of holiness looks like. Uh, I'll just tell you from the beginning, we're probably not going to answer, you know, all your questions. But today I've been praying, and my heart's been really wrestling with this passage and this specific approach because uh, we're all in this pursuit of knowing Jesus more. But here in a moment, we're going to read a passage from Peter, which reminds us of of a Levitical moment where God's talking to Israel about being holy for God is holy, and what that pursuit of holiness really looks like in our life in three key areas. And so I'm going to pray before we get any further, and then I want to read a quote for you. But let me pray, and then we're, we're going to move on. Jesus, thank you so much for your word, God. I just pray that you would continually get our thoughts and ourselves out of the way so we can hear from you, 
God, I even thank you for the moment of just silence we could have together as a family because I believe in silence sometimes we hear from you better. So God, I pray that you would silence our thoughts and our worries and God, may we just explicitly seek out your voice. And Lord, would you help us on this journey of knowing you and specifically this morning, this pursuit of holiness we're called to. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, I read this book called The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a, it's a brilliant book. It's amazing. I would encourage you to go find it, The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And uh, it was a book that I read, and um, a friend had recommended it to me, and I was like, I'm going to read this every year. I read it the first year and then lost it, so then I didn't read it for many more years until I just found it the other day. But I do remember this quote quickly from it that I wanted to share with you before we jump into what the pursuit of holiness looks like, what Peter's sharing with us today. So Jerry Bridges says this, kind of on the relation of pursuit of holiness, he says, when we become Christians, we do not drop all our habits of sin overnight. In fact, we will spend the rest of our lives putting off these habits and putting on habits of holiness. And it was really intriguing to me because he's, he's so right, right? Like when we are given our life to Jesus, when we are, are like we've inherited salvation, we've said, we've believed and confessed, we've said yes to Christ. We know if you've done that before, you don't wake up the next day or in the next hour, you're sinless and perfect. You're not, right? On the contrary, you're wrestling more than ever with the sins that you so commit, right? And it's this process that we then call sanctification of you beginning steps to grow closer to Jesus and actually break off the old way of life and then inheriting the new and embracing the new. There's some things, of course, you could say that when you become a Christian, you just completely cut off and you don't see again. And that's so good. Glory to God. But there's many things that we still wrestle with, wrestle with even till today, right? And so Jerry Bridges is on to something here that putting off, right, the old habits of sin, but yet picking up and putting on the habits of holiness. And what might those be? We'll kind of get to a little, a few of them here this morning. We're going to start in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 17. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 17. I realized in the first service that I was planning to go 13 through 25, really only hit here. So we're going to kind of go the same route, but maybe we have some extra time at the end to jump into it. So we're going to jump in 1 Peter 13 through 17 and see how far we get together. Um, it says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober... Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you even when Jesus Christ is revealed that is coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges these persons work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So we see here this statement, for it is written, be holy for I am holy. Uh, Peter's actually referring to Leviticus 19, this moment where literally it says, be holy for the Lord your God is holy. And the Lord is talking to Israel at this time and how is Israel can actually live as a holy nation and begins to go through most of the Levitical law. And, but yet we're in a new law, a new covenant with God today. And so what might being holy for God is holy look like. And I think uniquely, Peter already explained some of this in a few, a few of these verses here that we're going to start with today. And so point number one for you today in 1 Peter 1.13 is be alert. See, 1 Peter 1.13 um, brilliantly says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, right? What might that mean? I, I, I just think back to weeks ago, uh, our little baby Baker, nine-month-old Baker, he got stung in the face by a wasp in our backyard. It was the worst, right? Yeah. We took him to the ER because, you know, the back of Benadryl bottles basically say, like, don't give it to your baby or they'll die, you know, and you're like, oh, what do we do, you know? And of course, we go to the ER, they say he's fine, um, and they give him Benadryl. And so I'm like, so is it a refund on this thing? Like, how's that work? You know, like, are we good? Uh, how do I not pay for this moment? Because I could have done that at home, right? But either way, we're so glad he's okay. We would have done that precautionary anyways because we don't know what he's allergic to yet, right? And so, in this moment, um, I'm realizing, man, there's a wasp nest, and we kind of saw it. It was a ground nest. We saw where they were going in and out, but we didn't see the full extent. And so a few weeks go by to this last Friday, okay? I'm in my backyard near that where I think it is, and so I'm like, okay, I want to take care of this thing. It seemed all right, and so I go up to it and begin to move. It was like a potter, like, bottom, like, over the top of the ground nest. I, like, barely move anything. I, like, walk up to it, and a swarm of wasps, I mean, hundreds and so my response then is what? To be alert and run, right? I'm like, I ain't about this, okay? And so I begin this process of then planning, and, and, and like I'm alert now. These bees, these wasps are everywhere, 
right? And so I'm beginning to plan and think, how am I going to navigate this situation? Because we know the grave danger is here. And so in my brilliance, I plan to navigate it by finding a stick like this long and poking it out of the hole, like poking it, you know? And so you know how that goes, okay? As I'm poking this thing, they get even more mad, and I took the stand up, you know, back up, and then one stung me in the bald spot back here, which was the worst. <laughs> and it was like a double hit at my manhood, too, because I already have a bald spot, and then they stung it. And I'm like, what the heck? And it hurts now. So now, I, like, you know, I told the first service, I was like, and we should have done this, Michelle. We should have had, like, a back camera so you see, like, the bald spot. That would have been cool. We'll do that another time. But in either way, like, right, I, I was faced with this moment, and really I began to learn that this is the exact op- opposite situation that Peter's actually talking about. That see, my alertness started after the fact that I nonchalantly said, this isn't a big deal. I know there's a nest here, and so I'm just going to kick it over and deal with it. And it's like, no, 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 no. Peter's actually urging us and telling us our primary response to living our lives in the pursuit of holiness, right? To be holy as God is holy is to be alert and of sober mind. You start there. You don't end up and trip and accidentally get there to then respond. That alertness is actually a lifestyle of beginning with and not in just response, I, I, it was so uniquely in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, he doubled downs on this, right? Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the what? Same kind of sufferings. Be alert first and foremost as your primary stance to your pursuit of holiness in God, knowing that there's things and traps ready to capture you. That these nests, you probably don't know where they're at, but you're going to step near them and be alert and ready to see when there's one bee, there's probably a thousand. You can step back and prepare and disengage and move on and flee from the very sin you might be entrapped in. So there's my example of not practicing this, I guess, very well with the bees. But, you know, overall in our spiritual life, to be alert and sober mind is required of holiness. And Peter's explaining that living the way God wants us to actually needs to begin now and not something we stumble into or react to. And let me be clear, like sometimes we, we wrestle and we fall in and, 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 and we somehow, like we run into sin and it just happens. And so we need to take a step back, right? And say, okay, that, that's a temptation for me now. And that's okay. But yet the alertness begins there and now you won't stumble back into it or hopefully not. So being alert is very key to this pursuit of holiness in our life. Being alert is so much more than casually living, but intentionally living to please God with our actions. Intentionality and discipline. Number two from 1 Peter 1.13 as well, set your hope in Jesus. I wanted to highlight this as we're just talking through our pursuit of holiness and what our hope has to do with that. Um, Right before this passage, Peter is really talking on the extent of grace, right? And and we know grace to be so true that Jesus on the cross for our sins is grace for our lives, right? And we also hear this word mercy bouncing around too every once in a while in Scripture, a lot actually. Uh, But really quick, students, if you were at student night last week, we talked specifically about this difference of grace and mercy because they're very, very similar, yet they both have different effects and, and really impact us way differently in our life. So, so this grace piece, and um, specifically with Jesus, he's, he's talking about it you know, right before this passage. This grace is that gift that we don't deserve that we receive from God, right? And so whenever Jesus dies on the cross for our sins, he's giving us the gift of grace. It is by grace you have been saved by faith. And so we are then given a gift of forgiveness and salvation, process of sancti- you know, our lives as a gift from God. But yet, mercy is a little different because mercy is actually for us not to receive what we so deserve. And so if we remember in Romans, for the wages of our sin is what? Death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We notice that the mercy that God extends is also unique because we deserve death based on our sin, yet God shows his mercy by not giving us that very death, by not giving us a punishment we do deserve. And so it's unique, like we think, like as you, as you work through those, you think like God is so good. He extends us mercy and then gives us a gift of grace. He's like, he's like really serious about loving us, right? 
like in both ways, he's, he's extending love to us just in different, different extents. So setting our hope in Jesus on our pursuit is so important because setting our hope on Jesus looks like giving our lives to Christ, looks like salvation, looks like setting our hope in him, not only for today, but our future eternity. But yet sometimes I think we can wrestle with stopping at just today when we set our hope in Christ. I, I, I wrestle with some friends that I grew up with and, and, and some others that had gone through things, you know, different things, either they were in the Catholic faith or the Christian faith, wherever, and they feel like at some point they've arrived and they've been confirmed and so everything's good, or they've given life to Jesus, so we don't need to do anything else. Let's just do whatever we want. I'm like, oh, that's so not the heart of God for you. That's so not the calling of God for your life. And actually, I believe it's a completely false doctrine for you to believe in. He doesn't call you just to be saved and find salvation and then do nothing with it. But yet he calls you to live hope-filled. Let it fuel your faith. Let it continue by the hope that's within you, a life of righteousness and pursuit of holiness. Let it not stop with you in the day you said yes, but continue in you, continue in you until the day you see him face to face. Setting our hope in Jesus is so important, and I think of its complexity, right, in our culture today. Because the word says, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you in Jesus, when Jesus returns. And so setting our hope in that is, is complex, like I said, because in our world today, we can often think of hope as wishful thinking, right? And, and that's contrary to what the Bible's saying, actually. Because you think of hope like wishful thinking, like I, I have some teenagers, some students I'm working with, and they come on a Sunday night to student night, and they say, I really hope I get an A on that test. And I'm like, oh, yeah, me too. So did you study? And they're like, no. And I'm like, that is wishful thinking, right? You're just wishing for the greatest outcome. That, that's probably not going to work. Or you think if you're dating or before you were married, right, and, and you were dating your spouse and you just went home and you're like, I, I really hope they like me like I like them. That's wishful thinking, right? You're hoping. And luckily I was, I was right in my <laughs> wishful thinking when I met what, my wife Noelle because all my friends were like, she's too good for you. She's too beautiful. You're ne that's a, good luck. You're never going to land that one. You know, she's way too good for you. And I'm like, I know but I really hope that she likes me like I like her. And I, I'm so blessed and thankful to God that she does. She does. We're married. She does. <laughs> okay, that sounded the way I like ended that was like, <laughs> does she? I think, I don't know, that's how I read it from my mouth, so I'm sorry, but she does love me, I think. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I know she does. Sorry. I know she does. Can we unrecord that? How does that work? Can we like undo? Can we back up? Either way. I know she loves me. I love her deeply. So, uh, But this hope is, this hope of wishful thinking is different than the hope that we so are taught biblically. Because biblical hope is, is not wishful thinking. When we have biblical hope in Jesus, it's actually deeper than that. It's a confident expectation. Because our hope in Jesus is the truth that not only sets us free today, tomorrow, and eternity. It's hopeful expectation. It's confidence in Christ for our lives. Confidence that he would work in us today and tomorrow for eternity to be with him. I, and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, I just feel like part of this is this, this hope that we receive from Jesus really fills our faith and fuels it to live on day by day. This confident expectation. And that's what I see between being hopeful and hope-filled in our faith. Hopeful is okay. We can walk hopeful throughout our life today, but when it comes to our faith in Christ, we're hope-filled. It's for eternity. It's certain. We can be confident in it, and that's the hope we can face each and every day. Philippians 1, 6 expounds on this, being confident in, in this, that he who began a good work in us would complete it. We can be hope-filled in our walk today. And lastly, in 1 Peter 1, 14, um, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Choose obedience. This is my last point for you today. Out of an alert and sober mind, with our hope set in Jesus, we can effectively choose obedience each and every day. You know, I, uh, I'm, I'm only 31, and I 
you know, I have two little kids, and so I'm so in this realm of having kids that I'm training them to be obedient, right? And so if you're not there, if you've been there, you can kind of connect with me a little bit. If you're a student and a kid yourself, you know, just think on being obedient to your parents in this moment, okay? Uh, But either way, I have a daughter who's two and a half. She'll be three in December, and we are just wrestling with obedience in our house, right? And I think sometimes it helps to uh, us in our faith, and um, but doesn't in the fullness, just helps me to think through uh, and helps my daughter to think through the consequences of her disobedience, right? And if we think naturally with our faith too and think through the consequences of our disobedience, how hard those things we face are. Like the consequences to our disobedience in Christ and our sinful nature, man, there's so much pain. There's so much hurt and brokenness. It really stinks. It maybe breaks relationships that take years to repair. It maybe begins habits that take years to to rewind. And it maybe takes time that you'll never get back. And and, and this isn't the reason why we're obedient, right? We don't look at like the re, like the these like fears and say, okay, I want to be obedient just so I don't deal with that. No, obedience should be just because we want to be holy like Christ. And we want to please him and, and give him glory and love him and, and understand that he's, he's dedicated like a life for us that we could live to the best of our ability so we may be fleeing from sin. But I think naturally, and Paul, Peter's specifically saying here, that fulfilling God's call to holiness requires that we break off of this old lifestyle that the world might have characterized us in. That we break off from the sinful flesh that we so wrestle with and begin to take on newness of life in Christ and our hope in Christ. That we may effectively give him the glory he so deserves. That we may specifically, specifically love Jesus even a little bit like he loves us, even a lot of it. So I think naturally of glow sticks, and I don't know if you've played with glow sticks recently or anything, but you know, they have to be broken to be beautiful. That's just the part of the process. And I think naturally in our walk with Jesus and as we've given our life to Christ and we begin this process of sanctification, I'm reminded really quickly of how quickly we need to be broken off old things to be beautiful in Christ. And so I'm thinking very specifically, right, of breaking off habits of lust and choosing purity. Thinking of breaking off habits of hatred and choosing love. Breaking off habits of lies and deceit and choosing truthfulness. And what ways might you need to begin and continually break off the old pattern of life you so were in sin to, and yet hang on and press forward to the righteousness of God, uh, righteousness of God that He's calling you to? If we remember the words of Jesus in John fourteen fifty, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, there will be obedience. So I think so often that. Maybe an encouraging word to you that we tell our daughter, um, or at least I, I know I do so many times a day. I know my wife does too, but I feel like I say it so much. Like I just, it's like my divert go-to. She's much better like of just explaining things to her, and I'm just very quick to say, you know. But a reminder may be that, in, in the way I talk to my daughter, is that, Della, I love you, and I know you can choose obedience. And what if you were to hear that from God today? How would it change your perspective? That God says, I love you, and I know you can choose obedience. Not by your power, like, forget about the way you do it, and remember that I love you. You can choose obedience today. And how different that encouragement might hit you in the way you pursue holiness, in the way you break off away from the life that you once so lived and embrace the new life in Christ you have so received. That God loves you, and you can choose obedience. In our pursuit of Christ, we are foreigners set apart for holy living. And 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. The idea of this holiness is being set apart, very explicitly. We see that throughout all of Scripture, this this idea that we are set apart. We are different than the world that we live in. We are foreigners, even the Scriptures say, too. And so what does that look like to be set apart? What does that look like to be actually set apart for the glory and goodness of God and where you work, in your homes, in your friendships, in your marriage, in our church? 
What might it look like to be set apart for God's purposes and not our own? And that, my friends, I believe puts us on a path in pursuit of holiness. And so maybe this morning you're wrestling with some of the things I said to break away from, but maybe you need to begin to make a list or make, make one statement somewhere you can write on a place you need to break off, break away from the old and choose obedience to living in the new. Maybe you need to begin to go home and, and like I said, heed that encouragement of reading God's word and begin to have an alert and sober mind to what is around you. Begin to actually choose to take intentional steps towards following Jesus in your pursuit of holiness. Or maybe, maybe today you need to begin and continually set your hope in Jesus. You've gotten fearful, you've gotten upset, you're scared, but yet you need to be reminded that it's not a hopeful, wishful thinking that Jesus may return and he's good, but that it's a confident expectation that he is who he is and it's truth for us today. So thank you so much for journeying through that. I'm going to pray for us and specifically for you in many of those areas, and then I'm going to invite the band up to close us in a song. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your word, God. Thank you for this pursuit you have us on of chasing after you and um, seeking you, Lord, to be holy as you are holy. God, you know the complexity of what that brings to our lives as we're in different places with you. Maybe some of us need to just surely set our hope in you and salvation first for the first time. God, I pray that your spirit would be so close to us in guiding and directing both friends and family members or people around us to, to push us more towards you. God, maybe some of us are on this journey, this pursuit longer than others. I just ask, Lord, that you would continually refine us and edify us by your word, by others who love you. God, that we may be as closely like you as possible here on earth. God, I pray for my friends who are breaking away old things and restoring them to new, true things in you. God, I pray that you would give us strength and courage as we do so. But Lord, I ask that you would bless us Thank you for going before us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.